Monsters is a podcast about the worst human beings on the planet. The episodes of this podcast deal with murder, dismemberment, torture, rape, child abuse, and mental illness. Please turn back while you still can. Listener discretion advised. Tiffany Moss abused her stepdaughter, Imani Moss, so severely that she lost her job as a preschool teacher. Once that happened, she became a stay-at-home mom to Imani and her own two children. With her husband, Iman Moss, working two jobs to support the family, the mother began starving Imani until she died just days before Halloween in 2013. Then she convinced Iman to burn the body and pretend the girl had run away. This is Monsters. Come back and find out that he's deceased. Tapping me on the head, telling me I'm cheating, telling me I'm... Let me see your phone. Just kill her. And she died. I think Diego Campione is totally in the wrong, and I hope he burns in hell for all his sins. Hell's not a very fun place. I only have two hands. I'm that four hands girl. I'm two hands. And her nose just get escalated and escalated. <laughs> Filicide is the act of a parent killing their own child, but the definition extends to step-parents as well. Filicides by step-parents are common, and those deaths are more likely to have involved long-term abuse. Like the case with Imani Moss, when a stepchild lives in a home where the abuser has their own biological children, they are at increased risk of ongoing abuse and neglect. This is called the Cinderella Effect when step-parents treat their biological children well while physically abusing or even killing their stepchildren. This case is most likely an example of fatal maltreatment. One would hope that Moss was not intending to starve Imani to death, but due to the evil treatment she gave her stepdaughter, that's what happened. That's only speculation, though. Her intent may very well have been to cause the death of Imani. We don't know because Moss has never explained why she treated the young girl the way she did. But what other result would you expect if you stopped feeding a 10-year-old child? Iman Moss met Tiffany Brown when he was introduced to her by a friend at his church, which he explains during his testimony in court. How do you know Tiffany Moss? Um, she's my wife. Are you currently married? Um, yes. Um, when did y'all meet? Um, we met, I us say around, when I first met her, I want to say around 2007. Okay. At the church. What church was that? Um, Freedom Christian Church. Were you attending that church? Yes. Um, with who did you? Who did you usually go to church with? Um, me and my daughter. Right. Who's Victor. your daughter? Um, me, money. Um, and how did you meet? How did you meet the defendant? Um, I met her through a friend that knew uh, that knew her. The two dated for several months, during which time Tiffany was introduced to Amon's daughter, Imani, who would have been three or four years old at the time. Amon tells the court about when the girl was born and what happened with her biological mother. Tell, uh, can you tell me when Imani was born? Yes. She was born April 23rd, uh, 2003. And did you at that time have a relationship with Imani's mother? Yes. Um... Where is Imani's mother now? Do you know? Honestly, I do not know. Um, at some point, did you go to court and get sole custody of... Yes, sir. ...of Imani? Yeah. Did you have a document that terminated the parental rights of Imani's mother? Yes, I had a legitimate... I uh, think legitimate mice... I know through the court. I just can't even pronounce it right now. Okay. Said legitimate, uh, legitimized. I can't say it. I'm and did her, did her mother surrender her rights in in that same court case? Yes, sir. Did you, did did Amani's mother ever have any relationship with her, other than giving birth to her? Um, I said at one time we were staying together, but after that, it was more like uh, her using the key as a pawn. All right. Um. Do you know whether or not, uh, during the time after you uh, got sole custody, did you ever give her mother any visitation, or did Amani ever go see her mother? Um, 
once I did that, uh, the location that she was living at, um, the number that she gave me, she was gone, and I didn't have no way of getting in touch with her. Okay. So is it fair to say that for a number of years prior to 2013, Amani had no contact with her birth mother? True. Imani was born on April 23, 2003. The girl had already had one mother figure fail her in life. Her biological mother, who was a drug addict, gave up her parental rights and Iman began raising the little girl on his own. Records show that Imani's biological mother had five children total and that she had surrendered her parental rights to all of them. In July of 2009, Iman and Tiffany married and moved into Iman's rented apartment. The couple would go on to have two children of their own, a son and a daughter. The identities and location of these children have been sealed by the courts. It is known that the investigators found no reports or signs that Tiffany's biological children had suffered any abuse or neglect. In 2010, Imani Moss was having difficulty completing her schoolwork, and her teacher had reflected that on her report card. Imani told the school nurse that she was afraid to bring the report card home because she thought her parents would hurt her. She then told the nurse that her stepmother had hit her with a belt. This opened a can of worms that would lead to the arrest of Moss. Iman describes the events in court. Um, I was at work, and um, I get a phone call from, a, I think, a detective. I can't remember her name, but I know I got a phone call from a detective saying I had to come to the police station. They didn't tell me what. They just said I needed need an emergency. I think Batani they said Batani to your child, so I just left work, let my manager know, and I just hopped in the car and just drove all the way down there. Right. While you were at the police department, did you find out that your wife had been accused of, of beating your child? Yes, when I got down there. Right. And did you give a statement to the police in that regard? Uh, yes, I spoke with the uh, detective. And did you become aware that she was eventually arrested? Yes, uh, she got arrested there. And do you know whatever happened with that case? to the plea of probation five years to my knowledge tell me what life was like after that at your house <laughs> it was rough um, was Tiffany allowed to work as a teacher after that no did Tiffany ever work after 2010 no um, so it sh it sh what did she do? Stayed at the house. Stayed, stayed at Hurley's house? Yeah. It, it, wherever we were living, she stayed at the house. Right. Did you feel like her, her job at that point was to take care of the kids? Yes. Tiffany Moss had used a belt to spank Imani for not doing well in school. It's believed that Moss hit the girl with the buckle side of the belt, and police found several bruises and welts on her chest, back, shoulders, arms, and legs. Moss was arrested on child cruelty charges and took a plea deal with a sentence of five years probation. Imani Moss was taken from the home and placed in the care of her grandmother, who was Iman's mother, Robin Moss. She lived with her for six months while Iman took a parenting class and Tiffany went through an anger management program. Then, Imani was allowed to go back to live with her father and stepmother. Robin Moss had suggested that Imani stay with her, but Iman refused. He would say in court, quote, In my pride, I was trying to prove something to my mom, that I can do it, and I said no, end quote. He admitted that Imani should have stayed with his mother. The arrest also caused Moss to lose her job as a teacher. A conviction of child abuse made it so she couldn't get another job teaching, something she had a degree in. This most likely caused a great deal of resentment toward Imani, causing the stepmother to decrease the care she gave to the girl. It also caused Iman to take on a second job to support the family. He explains in court how his rigorous schedule left him no time at home with the children. Tell, me, tell the jury what your schedule was while you lived at the Veranda Chase apartment. Um, on typical Monday to Friday, um, from 6.30, the first job, KGP, 6.30 to 3.30. Um, Able to express, it's a little bit different. It starts at 6.00. And it depends on if you finish up the work in order for you to go home. So I say average, probably 1 or 1.30. So 
sometimes in, in the morning. In the morning. Um, how long did it take you to get to your job? Um, it was right off of Old North, uh, I think, yeah, Old North Cross Road. So it was about, I want to say, 15 minutes. So what time did you have to leave your house in the morning to get to your first job? First job, because it was on the other side of Swanee, I would have to leave, to be on there, to be on time, I'd say 5 in the morning, just to be on time because it'd be traffic. And what time would you get home from your first job? Uh, I want to say a little bit, probably with traffic at the end, I'd say about 4.30, almost 5. And then what time would you have to leave for your second job? About 5.30, because I had to be there at 6. And then what time would you get home at night? Anywhere from 1 to 1.30. And then what did you do from 1.30 to 5.30? I would try to go get some sleep and get up and do it again. For years, Iman Moss would leave his house at 5 o'clock in the morning and go to his first job, get home at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the evening, leave again at 5.30 to go to his second job, and get back home between 1 or 1.30 in the morning. That gave him about three or four hours to get some sleep before getting up and doing it again. This gave Tiffany Moss all the time to do whatever she wanted with the kids without Iman ever knowing what was going on. Not only was Iman gone most of the time, but in the summer of 2013, Imani's school was notified that she would not be coming back the following school year. They were going to homeschool her instead. This gave Moss the ability to abuse and neglect Imani without any watchful eye to notice. Iman would explain how, when he was taking care of the kids on weekends, Imani ate a lot of food. Let's go to, to the week, approximately the week of October the 24th of 2013. Um, at that point, had you noticed that Imani was sick? Yes. Tell me what, tell me what you mean, what I mean by okay. sick or what you mean by sick. Well, when we, um, moved to Verena Chase, when we were saying with me, she had, had a growth spurt, but she was thin, but she started to get thinner when we moved to, uh, Verena Chase. Whose responsibility did you feel at that point was to feed your child? Um, during the weekday, uh, Tiffany, and mostly on the weekend, it was me. Right. And on the weekends when you were with Amani, did she eat? Yes, she would, she would try to eat a lot. Actually, on the weekends, she would like, try to gouge. You mean gorge? Yeah, yeah, gorge. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I don't <laughs> mean to correct you. Okay. I don't want to change your words, but okay. that sounds gorge. like what you meant to say. Um, and that was during the basically the summer of 2013, right? Yes. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, almost going into the fall of September. You moved into the apartment yeah, in, in September. September. So it would have been in the fall of 2013, right? Yeah. Um, did Imani get thinner? Yes. And did she did she seem like she had uh, lost her ability to to be active? Yes. Iman says that Imani did have a growth spurt where she got thinner, but then she continued getting thinner. It was Tiffany's responsibility to feed the kids on weekdays, obviously, since he was gone working 20 hours a day. On the weekends, Iman would feed the kids, and he says that Imani would gorge food. This makes sense in hindsight, as she wasn't being fed during the week. On Mother's Day of 2013, the Moss family paid a visit to Iman's sister, Sharonice. Iman's mother, Robin, was living with Sharonice, which is why they celebrated Mother's Day there. Robin testified at the trial about the condition of Imani. Where did you see her on Mother's Day? Uh, I was at my daughter's house, uh, living with my daughter, staying with my daughter for a while. And uh, my son and Tiffany came to the house, and Imani's, and Imani was with them. When they came, um, so there were several family members there at your daughter's house? Yes, us, my daughter, and Amon and his family. So my daughter, her family, and Amon and me. And tell me, um, what's your daughter's name? Sharonice. So you're at Sharonice's house, um, and uh, how did Amani appear to you then? She 
was so thin, so thin. She had this shirt on and you can see the bones protruding out of her shoulders and in her arms, she was so skinny. I wasn't used to that. How was her hair? Cut off, all of it, it's, it's cut. I'm gonna show you um, a photograph. Is that an accurate depiction of the way Amani looked to you in May of 2013? Yes. You said that you noticed her hair um, on Mother's Day. And what? why was it so different to you? Because Imani had long hair and it shouldn't have been cut. Did you ask about how um, her hairstyle came oh. to be like that? Yes, I did. I said, why is her hair cut off? And who did you ask that to? I asked Tiffany that. And what was the response? If you act ugly, you should look ugly. <laughs> Robin knew that Imani liked to have long hair and wear it in braids. That's why she was so shocked to see her granddaughter's hair gone. She was concerned about how Imani was being treated, but didn't realize that it would be the last time she would see the little girl. On October 24th, Iman had gone to work at his first job, but was having issues with his truck overheating. Between jobs, he thought he had fixed the problem, so he left to go to his second job. On the way there, his truck began overheating again, so his supervisor let him leave early so he could fix his truck. He said that he spent the evening replacing a hose and finished up around 10.30 p.m. Once he was done, he went inside to clean up. I come in, I go to the, uh, I think, the little laundry room and put my toolbox in. I go um, to the kitchen, um, said something about a new dish that she made, go and look in the refrigerator, I come out the kitchen and uh, Timmy tells me to come in and she said something wrong with Imani. I leave there, I go into the bathroom, she's in the tub, and um, she's shaking like she's having a seizure. So what did you do? Um, I didn't go with my first mind. I, I said we need to go take her to 911 or take her to the hospital. Did Tiffany have anything to say about when you said that? Say we can't. Did she explain to you why you couldn't take your daughter to the hospital? She was real, real thin. Yeah, but did Tiffany, had, Tiffany, uh, did Tiffany tell you why you couldn't take your daughter to the hospital? No, nah, she didn't give me why. He says that Tiffany told him that there was something wrong with Imani and that she was in the bathroom, shaking like she was having a seizure. He immediately wanted to call 911 because, well, his daughter was clearly in medical distress, and that's exactly what you should do in that situation. Tiffany said they can't call 911. He says she didn't give him a reason, but she did. What was Tiffany telling you about what you needed to do at that point? Um, she was saying that we can't go, we can't call 911, we can't do that. Um, we got to hide the body. Well, what she um, tell, why, did she, why did she tell you that we can't call 911? I mean, you're this child's father. Um, because she said, uh, I'm on probation, I don't want to go to jail. Uh, Did she say anything about losing your other children? Yes. She didn't want to call 911 because she was on probation and didn't want to go to jail, and she also didn't want to have their other children taken away. Her main concern was herself. What would happen to her and her biological children? Which isn't surprising, since she's the one that starved Imani in the first place. Ultimately, Tiffany's suggestion was to hide the body, except Imani wasn't dead. Iman put her into her bed and tried to feed her over the next few days, but wasn't successful. Imani Moss laid in that bed for four days and slowly died of starvation. The 24th, you put, her, you put Imani in bed. Yeah. On the 28th, of October of 2013, did Tiffany notify you somehow that Amani had died? Uh, yes, yeah, she called me at work. That was that. Was that the? Do you remember? Was it the 28th or the 29th? Uh, that day, I'm trying to uh, judge the week. Think about it in terms of, okay, was it one or two, was it two or three days before Halloween? 
might have been a day before Halloween, or if it's not Halloween, I'm trying to think before Halloween. And how did how did you get the notification that Armani had died? It was on a Tuesday, I know, Mike. When um, it was uh, through a phone call. Right. Where were you when you got the phone call? I was at work. You... And did you actually speak to Tiffany, or did you just get a text? Um, I think I talked to her on the phone. And what did she tell you? Uh, she said uh, she's gone. She didn't say too much. She said she's gone. So when I came home... Wait, wait a minute. When you okay, came okay. home, did okay. you leave work? I did not leave work. I couldn't leave work. I left work after I got out. I tried to leave early, but she didn't let me get a half day. So I actually left work on the regular time. At 3 o'clock or 3.30 in the afternoon? Yes, sir. And... What did you do when you got home? Um, at this point, I'm devastated. I'm really messed up, uh, honestly. I go in the room, and from that time, you know, I usually take a nap. I was in the room with um, with a Imani body until about time to go back, go to work to Avery. All right. Let me ask you: Did you do anything to confirm that she had died? She was dead. How could you tell? I've been in a lot of funerals, and I, I can tell, you know, she was cold. Her essence was there. Um, her eyes, she was gone. He got a call while at his first job informing him that his daughter had died, and he still finished out his workday. He drove home where he wrapped the body in a blanket and moved it into the computer room. They left the body there for at least two days. Iman testified that he would go into the room and sit with her body and grieve. Outside of that, he continued to work his two jobs, and the family went back to normal. He continued to suggest that they call the police, but Tiffany wouldn't have it. They finally agreed to get some supplies and dispose of Imani's body. Around the 30th of October, Iman went to a local Walmart where he purchased a metal garbage can, a bag of charcoal briquettes, and some lawn bags the big plastic bags you use to pick up leaves and grass clippings. He brought them back to their apartment, where he and Tiffany began preparing to dispose of the body. Um, I go to the computer room. She come in, uh, she come in to help me then. Um, I get the body, I take it back into her room. Into whose uh, room? Imani's um, bedroom. Take the body to Imani's bedroom. Uh, I am wrapped the uh, blanket that she's wrapped in. Take her body out. Hang on a second, Mike. Okay. You got one step. Okay. Um, did you ever put duct tape on? Uh, I was about to get to that. <laughs> from that, that I was, you know, laying it out from my wrapping. So you put a, you put a blanket over her. Yeah. What did you do? So she's already in the blanket, sir. So I'll take her to the room and, you know, and wrap her out the blanket. And, um, you know, I'm, at that time, like I said, I'm not familiar with rigor and mortis, but it done set in. And it was hard to bend the body, and that's where the duct tape came in, involved in. And um, at that time, uh, Tiffany's in there in the bedroom with me, uh, helping me do this. After that, she helps me, you know, because um, she's, she's a lot more heavier than she was before. To put the, you know, put her in the uh, lawn bag. Um, where was the trash can at that point? Trash can was in the uh, vehicle, the uh, trail bag. And did, w once you got Imani into the trash bag, what did you do then? Um, from that moment, uh, um, you know, I tied up the bag, the trash bag that, that she was in, and then I took another bag. And she took, I think Tiffany took the blankets and stuff that she had and put them all in the other cell. So you packed one garbage bag with blankets and, and mm -hmm. were there clothes in it? Yes. And so you have two of these trash bags, one of them with your daughter. And what do you do then? Uh, from that then, um, I take the trash bag and then the body and I, and I put her in the back of the trailblazer. They put Imani's body into one of the lawn bags and clothes and blankets into another bag. Due to rigor mortis, they had to use duct tape to fold the body up so it would fit into the bag. 
They then loaded the bags into the back of the truck. Both Imani and Tiffany put their two other children into their Chevy Trailblazer and started driving around looking for a place to burn Imani's body. Because when you want to burn a dead body, you can't hire a babysitter. That just leads to questions. They found a secluded area that suited their needs and pulled the garbage can out of the truck. Iman poured the charcoal briquettes into the bottom of the can. The couple worked together to load Imani's body into it. He sprayed her with lighter fluid and lit her on fire. Iman describes the events during his testimony. I lifted the trash can out. Um, I opened the bag. Of, I opened the bag of uh, charcoal and pulled it in the tin can. In the garbage? Uh, yeah, the trash can, the tin can. Uh, and from that point, um, <coughs> she uh, she helped me open the bag up where, you know, with my body, you know, wrapped up in duct tape. She helped me put her um, body in the um, tin can. Did you put her head up or head down? Uh, uh, head up. Did you have to force her into it? Uh, kind of, yeah. So? Not not really forced. I just had to angle, um, I had to put her at an angle. After you put Imani in that garbage can, what did you do then? Um, I sprinkled some um, lighter fluid on, you know, on the body and um, on charcoal. And what? And then, uh, you know, I light, I took the charcoal and I lighted it on it, um, fire and I dropped it in the uh, tin can. So did it start to burn? It started to flame real, uh, real big. And I, so what were you doing at that point? Um, I was, I was standing out and, you know, I was standing and she was out there with me. I mean, did y'all say her. anything or would you just stand and watch the fire? Um... As I did it, um, I, I couldn't, I, like, I really didn't, I turned my back, I didn't watch it, and she said, I can't watch this. And it just burned. How long did you let it burn? Um, not that long. I want to say I let it burn for about, like, maybe five minutes, and I put it out. Why? Because it wasn't, it wasn't working in the way I thought it was supposed to work. And what did you mm-hmm. think was going to happen? <laughs> I know this sounds ridiculous, you know, I'm thinking it's like cremation. I don't know anything about that. So you thought that you you were going to reduce your daughter to ashes in that trash can? it didn't work like that. They believed that they would be able to burn Imani's body to ash, leaving no evidence behind. The plan was to burn the body to ash and then call police and report that the girl had run away. She had attempted to run away multiple times before, which made sense, since her stepmother was abusing and starving her. The problem was, they didn't realize how long it would take to burn a body to ash. Crematoriums can burn an entire adult body in as little as 90 minutes, but it generally takes a few hours. Criminals who have burned a body have revealed that it took as long as 8 hours for the body to fully burn to ash. It all depends on the size of the body and the temperature of the fire. Iman says that they only burned the body for about five minutes before realizing that they weren't going to be able to accomplish their goal. He put the fire out and they waited for the garbage can to cool down. Then they loaded everything back into the truck and went back home. The following day, Iman went to work as usual. With the emaciated and partially burned body of Imani still in the back of his truck, Iman struggled with what he should do. After he finished his shift at his second job, he met his cousin and best friend, Rudy, at a local quick trip gas station, where he asked for his advice. Did you tell your best friend Rudy, your cousin, did you tell him what had happened with Imani, this all this that you had just described to the jury? Yeah, not I didn't go in full detail, I just told him that she did and da 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 I did something stupid. And what did Rudy tell you to do? Call nine one one. And did you call nine one one right there from the quick trip? Yes, I, I left and got to the house, to my house, and called 911. And before, uh, okay, go ahead. Before you, before I called 911, I uh, went, I went back to the house. I told Tiffany, I like, man, we, this ain't right. We gotta call 911. And she was like, no, 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 no. I like, we gotta call 911. 
So did you take, so did you, what did she do? When you told her you're calling 911, what did she do? She get the kids ready, she get them dressed, she get dressed, she get in the car. Um, I think she got the trash can because the trash can wasn't in the car anymore. And she got in the car and she drove off to her mother house. At the time, I got called 911. And what, you called 911 at that point? Yes. And then the police arrived? Yeah, right. Rudy, being a normal, functioning human being, told Iman to call 911. Iman finally came to his senses and decided to take his cousin's advice. He drove back home and told Tiffany that he was going to call the police. She, in turn, loaded the kids into the truck, pulled the garbage can out, and fled the scene. Iman, sitting outside of his apartment complex with the dead body of his daughter inside of a garbage can, called the police and told them that he was suicidal. It was about 4 o'clock in the morning. Once police arrived, Iman tried to tell them that Imani had drank some chemicals and died, but they didn't believe his story. He was arrested, and in 2015, he pleaded guilty to one count of felony murder and one count of tampering with a body. He was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole and agreed to testify against Tiffany. Tiffany ultimately dropped her two biological children off at her mother's house and turned herself into police. The medical examiner had determined that Imani Moss had been starved to death. She weighed only 32 pounds at the time of her death. Once you um, have done that, do you take body measurements of um, when you're conducting an autopsy? Yes, um, we measure uh, what I refer to as the length because we can't measure while they're standing. It's not really a height, but I measure the length of the body and uh, we get a weight on a body scale. In this particular case, what was the height or the length, I should say, as you said, it's not truly a height, but what was the length of Amani Moss? Her body was 50 inches in length. And do you also, when you do that, do you calculate a percentile, especially for a child, um, in what percentile they would be in, um, in comparative to other children? Yes, I compare that to a standard growth chart. Um, and for uh, a 10-year-old girl, um, that length falls in the fifth percentile, meaning that approximately 95% of girls are uh, the same height or taller, and 5% of 10-year-old girls are shorter than that. With regard to weight, um, were you able to weigh Amani Moss? Yes. And what was her weight? 32 pounds. And what percentile, um, did you also do a, a comparison into a uh, percentile for that? Yes, uh, according to the standard growth charts, um, a 10-year-old girl uh, should weigh somewhere between 54 and 103 pounds. So this is at less than the fifth percentile. On top of taking her physical measurements, the medical examiner also looked at her internal organs. Moving on to the liver, her liver weighed 340 grams, and ordinarily for a, a 10-year-old girl, it should weigh between 724 and 967 grams. So her liver was less than half um, of uh, what a normal liver should weigh. Um, her kidneys were also small for her age. Um, they were below uh, the normal, uh, the lower cutoff for, for normal weight. The prosecutor asked the medical examiner to explain why it was significant that her liver was so small. Generally, when a person um, has been starved, the uh, organs and tissues that show the changes first are the ones where there's a lot of energy storage. So fat is going to go early on, muscle is going to go early on, and the liver is going to go because it's a storage site for glycogen. And uh, so once... Um, all of the other sources of fuel in the body are used up, then the liver starts to um, shrink as the body uses that for fuel as well. Tiffany Moss was charged with one count of malice murder, two counts of felony murder, two counts of cruelty to children, and one count of concealing a death. Though Moss was provided with counsel, she chose to represent herself. She claimed that she was leaving it in God's hands. She declined to give an opening statement, and even though the prosecutor called 18 witnesses to the stand, Moss didn't question a single one of them. When the prosecutor was finished, the judge asked her if she had any questions, and she said no every time. 
Ms. Moss, will you have any cross-examination questions? No questions. All right. Over and over again, she turned down any chance at speaking or cross-examining witnesses. District Attorney Danny Porter had free reign of the courtroom during the entire trial. My name is Danny Porter. I'm the District Attorney for Gwinnett County, and along with my Chief Assistant, Lisa Jones, we're going to be representing the state of Georgia in this case. Because all crimes and all indictments are styled state versus the defendant. And we are here on behalf of the people of Georgia. For over 30 years, I've said exactly those same words as I begin every opening statement in every case I've ever tried. I was told once that if you have that ritual, it helps calm you down and lets you talk rationally and lets you speak to the jury calmly. But in this case, I'm not sure it works because this is a case of a Cinderella story gone horribly wrong. In this case, there won't be any glass slipper. There won't be any handsome prints. The defendant doesn't have to be home by midnight. And there won't be any happy ending. Because this is a case where you only have the evil stepmother. And as a result of that, an 11-year-old child was starved to death at her hand while her own children remained healthy and happy. During his opening statements, he told the jury about a 10-year-old girl who was beaten and starved by her stepmother, while the same mother's biological children were happy and healthy. He laid out the entire story from the beginning of Imani's life to when Iman and Tiffany met, all the way to the end of Imani's life without a single objection from the defense, the defense that consisted of Tiffany Moss. Moss didn't call any of her own witnesses, and she didn't give a closing argument. She just sat stone-faced as 18 people took the stand and described the horrible crime that she had committed against her 10-year-old stepdaughter. She showed no emotion and almost no interest of any kind in the information that was being presented before her. On April 29, 2019, Tiffany Moss was found guilty of all six counts. She remained silent through her sentencing hearing. She didn't make a statement to the jury. She didn't even call any of her family members to speak on her behalf. On May 1st, Moss was sentenced to death. After she received the death penalty, she finally accepted representation by a lawyer to file an appeal against her sentence. The Georgia Capital Defender Group has asked for a new trial, claiming that Moss was not fit to represent herself. They claim to have, quote, neuropsychological testing data that showed the defendant to have damage to the premotor and prefrontal regions of the brain, end quote. Judge George Hutchinson urged her multiple times to utilize the public defenders she had been provided, but she refused to the very end. It's unlikely that a new trial would provide her with an acquittal, but she could possibly get out of the death sentence, which she completely deserves. Thank you for listening to Monsters. For more stories of the worst people on the planet, you can visit our blog at thisismonsters.com.